Okay. Uh, so our next talk will be presented by Clemen Buchar. I assume that uh, everyone joining the presentation understands English, but um, if you needed help with translating your questions at the end of the talk, just post them into the public chat. Okay, so let's start. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Clement Buchar. I'm a physicist uh, and I'm a researcher in the atomic physics field at the Josef Stefan Institute in Ljubljana, Slovenia. Today I will present you my work on a do-it-yourself aerosol low-cost aerosol detector that was done during the Aeromed project, which was already introduced in the previous very interesting talk by Jerzy Sperka from Czech Metrological Institute. Since I'm one of few speakers not speaking Czech on this conference, let me show where I come from. I'm from Slovenia, that is Slovensko in uh, Czech. It's a small country with 2 million inhabitants, uh, not so far from Czech Republic, let's say on the other side of Austria. And uh, from Brno to Ljubljana, it's about five hours drive. And our capital Ljubljana is about, let's say the size of Ostra. Uh, we also have quite similar languages, but uh, still today uh, I will speak in English because you would probably not understand my language. Though, as I said, oba jezika sta si dosti podobna. This is the outline of my talk. I will start by explaining the working principle of the light scattering, low cost sensors. Then I will describe how we built a simple do-it-yourself aerosol monitor using Raspberry Pi and one of the low-cost sensors. I will show you how we struggled with the incomplete manufacturer's documentation and uh, then show you my analysis and modeling of the output of the sensor. Then I will present the calibration of the sensor in a controlled environment and finally how we used it in the environmental measurements. What are aerosols? This was already presented by Yerji. Just to recap a few sentences, there are tiny particles that float in the air. That can be anything, droplets, dust, soot, ash, or sea salt. Their sizes vary from few nanometers, sometimes they are referred as nanoparticles, to tens of micrometers. They can be of natural origin, like let's say from volcanoes or desert or from sea, or human origin let's say from traffic or from house heating. And they do have impact on the climate and on human health. And that means indoor and outdoor, though we are mostly focused on the outdoor aerosols. They are regulated by authorities. Uh, Yerji mentioned PM 2.5, PM 10, their regulation about the uh, permitted concentration in the air. and we know that society's awareness for air quality is increasing. Each year, more and more people uh, want cleaner air, cleaner nature. So there is bigger and bigger need for measurement of these parameters and of aerosols in air. Uh, today, I will discuss just one of the several possible detection methods for aerosols, and that is light scattering. Uh, Yerji also introduced this, so I will just be quick. In this method, we use a light source that emitted a light beam. This could be a laser or a light emitting diode. And as this light passes particles, small particles, it scatters. And the amount of the scattered light depends on the, of course, on the amount of the incoming light. The more light comes in, the more light is scattered. It depends on the wavelength of the incoming light. We know that some wavelengths scatter more than the others. That is the reason why the sky is blue. Then the amount of scattered light depends on the size and the composition of the particles and also on the angle of the observation. So this scattering is not uniform. Some uh, directions are uh, preferred than the others. Now a short history. 
just a few words. The first written transcripts about the scattering, that blue light scatters more than red light, was done by Leonardo da Vinci already in 16th century. He wrote this in the notebook that is now owned by uh, Bill Gates. And then after years or centuries, first machines, first apparata appears. And uh, here I have just for illustration, three devices for measuring aerosols in air based on the light scattering. Uh, they are described in this article that I referenced here above, but you can see that one of the first machines were in 1800, uh, and then they were more and more complicated. Up to now, when we can buy these professional devices on the market, there are several companies that produce these devices. They measure quite well the, um, the distribution, the size of aerosols in the air. The problem is they are very, very expensive. So the cheapest maybe start from 10,000 euros and they can go up to 100,000 euros. So they are very, very expensive. But as the as I, I mentioned, more and more people are interested in uh, the air composition, in the in do, do we breathe the clean air or not? So we have today a lot of cheap alternatives. If you search eBay or AliExpress for dust sensor or aerosol sensors, you get a lot of hits. And you see the prices here ranging from four euros up to 35 euros. And with a do-it-yourself community, we a lot of people are interested in buying these, connecting them to Arduino or Raspberry Pi and uh, build a device. Uh, the first questions that we meet when doing this is which one to choose. There are many and many of them, as you see. So I will, I will simplify things. First of all, I need some terminology. We need, uh, so what is a sensor and what is a device? Let me first define the word sensor. A sensor is a small part that converts a physical quantity. So in our case, it is reflected light. It converts this quantity into an electrical signal. And that's all the sensor does. Now, if we add some logic, some processing and some communication around these sensors, we get a device, okay? So there are many low cost boxes that I show in the previous slide that you can buy online, but most of them classify as device. This means someone has taken a sensor and then put around electronics and everything. And when you connect it to your computer, you already get a calibrated output in some units like micrograms per cubic meters or something. So this means you don't have to do anything. You just connect it and you read. And all the hard work, it means the calibration and, and everything was done by the manufacturer of this low cost device. The problem is, it's usually done wrong. And there is not much you can do. You have some numbers and you have no idea whether they are okay or not. So in this work, we started from the beginning. We took a sensor and then slowly built an electronic around and checked each step and finished then at the end with the calibration and the performance of uh, the device in the real environment. Uh, it turns out there are basically just two different sensors. One is continuous and one is passed. One is produced by a company called Chimier and the other one is produced by a company called Sharp. Okay. Let me briefly show you the basic differences between the two. Let's say in the right one, the continuous one, the light source is permanently switched on. And then this variation of scattered light is detected when the particles pass the active area. It means that we have zero background, a flat background, a photo detector sees a constant amount of light until a particle comes into active area. At that moment, the amount of reflected light is increased and we see this as a pulse. The problem with the continuous light source 
is that we need an airflow. So the air with the particles must be moving through the active area in order to introduce these pulses. And in this particular sensor, this airflow is done with the heating resistor. Because the light source is on all the time and the resistor uses energy all the time, this sensor is not very suitable for low power application. Let's say standalone battery run uh, machines. On the other hand, we have pulsed sensors where the light source is pulsed. We control the pulsing, so we control the amount of en energy used. Uh, and then the amount of scattered light pulse is measured. Uh, this one has non-zero background. So even if there are no particles in the active area, we still get some light reflected from the housing and from the plastics around it. But we get more light reflected if there are also some aerosol particles inside. The flow is not so important because uh, the light pulse is so short that during the pulse, those particles do not move. Imagine it as a high speed flash photography. But be between the pulses, it's okay that the air moves but we don't need really to control and precisely know the flow of the air. Let's first look at the continuous LED sensor. That is the, the one on the right-hand side of the previous slide from the factory Shinye, or maybe I can advance one slide and you will see how it is built. So infrared emitting diode is our light source and it emits the light in this direction. So if there are no particles, the light goes like this. But if there are particles in the active area, which is here in the middle, some of the light is scattered through the lens to the photodiode detector, and we detect this signal. Uh, I mentioned the moving air. The air moves like this. Its intake is at the bottom, and then it moves through the active area, and exhaust is at the top. And here at the bottom, you have heating resistor creating like a chimney effect here in this, uh, in this area. Uh, this is also why the sensor needs a couple of minutes to stabilize, to achieve a stable and uh, predictable airflow in this area. Okay, let's go back a little bit. What's the output of this sensor? The output of this sensor is binary. It's very simple. It's either zero, logical zero, or logical one. It means zero or five volts, for example. And whenever a particle is detected, uh, the signal falls from high to low for a certain amount of time. The more light that is reflected, the longer the signal stays down. What we need to do in our controller in our pro processor is just count the time while the output is low versus the time when the output is high. The longer the output is low, the higher the reflection light on the average and the higher is the aerosol concentration in the air. So we call this time encoded output. The percent of logical low signal gives us the concentration of the particular matter in the air. Uh, now there are quite a lot of problems with the calibration of this sensor. I've tried a little bit, but then I, I, I just gave up and went to another one, which I will introduce a little bit later. And uh, this year, uh, this year a new article appeared in International Journal of Environmental Science and Development with a very provocative title, what does the Shinye PPD low cost dust sensor really measure? So you see that uh, with these low cost sensors, it's really, really troublesome to say what actually they are measuring and how to calibrate them. But we will see more troubles ahead. Uh, this sensor is quite popular. It was one of the first one that came on, on the market. So you have many projects online. Here is, let's say, one. Uh, the Arduino project hub. Uh, when it's in detail, it's uh, written how you connect it and how you program it. But uh, again, the manufacturer does not give enough answers to this. And the questions that I uh, copy pasted at this, from this Arduino hub page, 
let's say there are two of them and they both have similar topics. Like one say, could you please advise me how do I use a unit micrograms per cubic meter or this one? I'm a bit confused about the units. So when you get the voltage out of such sensor, you need to convert it to a metrological unit. And that is the most difficult part of the job. Let's now focus on another sensor, which is the pulsed one. This is the one I used and I focused in. It's actually built very similar. So there is a source of infrared light. Uh, then there is an interaction area and at the angle of 60 degrees, there is a photo detector. This is the photo of such sensor disassembled, light source, and then the photodiode detector. And the yellow is the path of the scattered light. And then some electronics at the back. Now, if we look at the manufacturer instructions on the data sheet, it looks like it's very easy to set up and to interface. And the steps are as follows. They say, so put a logical signal on the input of the sensor. This turns on the light. And as the light source is turned on, an output pulse will appear on the output. And you wait a little bit, and then you measure the voltage on the output pin exactly 0 0.28 millisecond after you turned on the light. And then after measuring this voltage, you can switch off the light. And then this voltage that you just measured, go into this graph, find the voltage, and then translate it to the dust density in milligrams per cubic meter. This looks very nice, very simple, but it turns out that it's, it gives completely wrong results, unfortunately. The first question that I had here is what is relevant here? What is this magic number 0 0.28 millisecond? Is this the maximum value? Is this the peak of the pulse? So if I'm a little bit late, let's say 0 0.3 milliseconds, am I still getting a good results or not? The manufacturer does not say anything about it. And then I've checked the documentation of other researchers who use this sensor, but actually nobody questioned this. Everybody just said what the manufacturer said. Let's say this one, quoting, the analog signal becomes fully developed within 0 0.28 milliseconds, so the voltage is recorded at exactly 0 0.28 milliseconds. And then they, they uh, and analyze these results and uh, so on. Okay, we'll see a li little bit later what's really happening at the output. Now this is a schematics, how we uh, attach the sensor to our microcomputer. This is our microcomputer. And as I said, what we need is the output. The output turns on the light and then the light is emitted, it's scattered, the detector detects it and then does something, we don't know exactly what. And on the output, a pulse appears and then we need ADC, analog to digital converter, to sample this pulse and read the voltage on our detector. Um, there is also, there are also two elements, a resistor and a capacitor, which we will need in the next slide, I think, uh, that are recommended by the manufacturer. And we will see why. So, first let's see how this light source is switched on. When we open the transistor. So when we say, turn the light on, the current flows like this. It enters at the pin one, goes through the transistor, goes through the light emitting diode, and then through the limiting resistor and to ground. We all know if we want to uh, infrared or a normal light emitting diode, LED, uh, to light up and not to destroy it, we need a limiting resistor. Now, how much is this resistor? We don't know. The manufacturer doesn't say. So I opened and measured, and I get the resistor, the resistance about 3.9 ohms. So four ohms. That's for all of you who deal with LED diodes, know that this is a very, very low resistor, which at four or five volts would produce a huge current. So the current is about one amp 
one ampere, which is very, very much, and this will surely destroy the LED. Because normally these LEDs use about maximum 50 milliamps, maybe 100, not more. So this is 10 times or maybe 20 times too high current. However, it is allowed to have such a high current, but only if it's for a very short time. So it means this LED diode, this light la laser diode will give very short, but very intense pulse. That is okay. It's no problem. But if we do this, uh, if, if we do such pulses, which are not so short, but longer, we will surely destroy the LED. So that is the first problem that, you say, why has manufacturer done it this way? And in the next step, the manufacturer recommends two additional elements. So they say, put a resistor, put a capacitor. Okay, now this is a little bit different. Now we have two resistors, so we have an additional high resistor that limits the current through the LED not to destroy it. But in the very first moment, in the first millisecond, a, a full capacitor here can provide the required charge for the one ampere current that the, this LED wants to have really bright light pulse, okay? And if we forget to shut down the LED to switch off the light, uh, then this capacitor will get empty and this resistor will limit the current. So what we have here is actually a protection circuit. But the manufacturer you know, states that these two elements like resistor and capacitor mentioned above is required for pulse drive of the LED. They say, please use the one mentioned. Without these components, the device does not work. But as we saw right now, and I can tell you firsthand ex experience, the device does work. It works normally, just it's very easy to destroy. Okay, so this is actually not something that is required because if it was required, why didn't they just put it inside the sensor? Why do we need to provide it? So the answer is, this is actually a protection circuit. If you are careful enough, you can do without this. Okay, but let's say we, we, are, we are using this. And now, uh, now we have another problem. These two elements form so-called RC circuit. The capacitor needs some time to recharge after it is completely discharged after each pulse. And the higher the resistor, the slower it charges. We can define a characteristic time by multiplying R and C, which is in this case 33 milliseconds. And this on the right, you have a chart, it's exponential curve. So such a capacitor will fill up to 60% after one characteristic time. It will fill up to 90% after two characteristic time, and then up to 95% after three characteristic time. So let's say we need about three characteristic times to fully fill, to fully charge such discharge capacitor in our case. So we would need about 100 milliseconds to fill the empty capacitor. But the manufacturer says, you can repeat another pulse after 10 milliseconds. Now, this is a very short time. In this short time, the capacitor will not be able to fill up. You see, this is just maybe one third of the characteristic time. The capacitor will simply not be able to, to uh, charge up. So we try this, if this is true, and you can see here the results. So this is the voltages on the capacitors with different driving frequencies. And this red curve at the right hand side of, of the screen shows the manufacturer's recommended frequency of 100 Hertz. It means that the pulse is given every 10 milliseconds. And you see that the capacitor starts to fill. It's not completely empty yet, that's good. Then it starts to fill, but it's unable to fill up to, 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 the, uh, uh, to the voltage of, let's say, four or, four or five volts, or already another pulse comes that empties. Yeah. So we see that the LED diode here is not pulsing 
with its full power. But if we lower the frequency, these are the blue and the green curves, we can see that the capacitor is able to charge fully and then waits until the next pulse comes. Okay, so now we have found several things in the instructions of the manufacturers that just don't, don't fit together very well. And there are many questions. So the first question I've already posed, what is the relevant quantity in the output signal of the sensor? Is it the height? Is it exact, the voltage exactly at that time? Or what is it that we actually need to, to measure? Then the driving frequency and the recommended RC circuit, they are contradicting it with each other. Using that capacitor and that resistor, simply we cannot use them with such a high frequency. Then we don't know anything about internal circuits, how this uh, uh, light pulse is processed inside. There is a trimmer that we can change, but it's completely undocumented. They say it's calibrated at the factory, don't change it. That's all we know. We don't know the wavelength of the light. We don't know the active volume. We, the calibration given by the manufacturer is not very good. We know nothing about statistics and averaging. So if we measure this voltage several times per second, how, how long do we need to measure? Uh, do, 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 is one measurement enough? Or maybe we need to measure 10 seconds and then have, I don't know, 100 measurements and then take an average of that. There are no instructions about this. And even for the calibration, they say, if you can see this at the bottom of the screen, this is copied from the, the data sheet. It says, please be aware that all data in the graph are just for reference and are not for guarantee, whatever that means. Okay, so we have more questions than answers. The first thing that we do is let take a look at the real output parts of such a detector. Let me remember what is in the data sheet. In the data sheet, the output pulse goes up and then it's a little bit stable for a few moments and then it falls down. And the manufacturer says, measure the voltage here in this point after 0 0.28 milliseconds. Here at the bottom, you see about 20 or so real pulses that we sampled as output of the sensor. You can see that they are, each of them is different. Okay, and these were sampled within one second or maybe two or three, but they're very close together. So they should be sim similar, but they are not. Their height is quite different. And this dashed line corresponds to the time that the manufacturer recommends for sampling, so 0 0.28. So we are now even more puzzled. If we take an average shape of these pulses, we get the graph that we see here on the left. It is quite different that the one provided by the manufacturer. The peak is at 290 microseconds, so it's not a 2.8, but it's a 2.9, and it doesn't have this flat area here. So if, if we are a little bit late here, so we want to measure, let's say, the top. If we are a, a, little, a little bit late, we will measure too little, too small voltage. Uh, if the shape was like this and we measure a little bit late, we could still get the good results. So basically this is not so okay, this shape. Maybe we need to measure the top of the pulse and the top of the pulse can be measured at different ways. By the way, there is also a project on Arduino Hub within, with this particular sensor that I mentioned. And you can see at the code that the sampling time here, if of course, the same as the manufacturer re recommends, 280. So what we decided is to set up a device and uh, using uh, ADC, we use MCP2004 to sample the sensor output and then a controller, Raspberry Pi, to store all the data. And the idea was to digitize and save all the pulses. Each pulse we did not throw away, but we saved it in a file and then do later offline shape analysis of all these pulses. This is how the device looks like. This is the sensor, the LCD for some user interface and some data and the reset button is here. This is the schematics, again, Raspberry Pi with basically two outputs. One is to control the sensor, to switch the light on and off. And the other one is 
uh, communication with ADC chip, uh, which is connected to the output of the sensor. This is how it looks like. In reality, uh, this is ADC chip, and then the capacitor, the resistor, uh, and there is also a real-time clock module, which Raspberry Pi does not have, so to keep, to keep the clock uh, running uh, if we switch it on without uh, the network. And uh, this is the LCD for user interface. Okay, so now we can sample several peaks and for each peak, we can try to determine uh, the maximum. Uh, these dashed lines are the lines uh, in the moment that's recommended by the manufacturer. Uh, there are many ways to find the peak of a such curve. Maybe we can just use the, the highest point, which is sometimes okay, but sometimes not. Like here, there are two points which are quite of the same height. So what we can do is we can fit a quadratic function a parabola and maybe try to find the peak of this one. It sometimes work well, works well, sometimes not so well. We can be even more sophisticated. We can try to come up with some mathematical form of this shape of the pulse. So what I use is a simple convolution of a linear decaying function and the Gaussian function. And the, re the result is pulse like this with a very ugly equation here but it doesn't matter, the computer does do all, all the calculation. And uh, here we can describe an average shape of the pulse quite well. The blue dots are measured average shape and the red line is our fit of the ugly equation that you saw on the previous slide. And uh, with this, we can fit each of our pulses and we can determine the height or some other parameters. With this, we can also identify pulses which are bad. Let's say this one pulse, this pulse here, we can say maybe that it's, it's bad and uh, we can just, just discharge him. So we have then uh, also some kind of uh, threshold measurements, whether the pulse is beautiful enough to keep it for the further processing or not. Now the next step was a calibration. Uh, for the calibration of such sensor, you need very special equipment. What you need is you must have an air with the well-defined aerosol particles. And there are only few labs around Europe that are able to do so. So within the AeroMed project, I was able to find a partner in Paris. It's IRSN, Institute for Radiological Protection and Nuclear Safety. And they have a box in which they put on very small monosize latex spheres and they can control very well and observe their concentration in air. So we can prepare aerosol atmosphere the way we want. So we made measurement on three different sizes of aerosol, 0 0.4 micrometers, one micrometer and four micrometers. And in parallel, we have controlled this atmosphere with very expensive and precise equipment to be able to compare it with what our sensor results. And here is the first result. You have time here at the, at, at the bottom. Uh, the red one is our sensor, and this is the left scale peak height in millivolts. And on the right hand, you have true particle concentration. So how many of these spheres were per cubic centimeters? This is the blue one and controlled by an, a specialized uh, equipment and very precise uh, monitor. So you can see we started in the afternoon and then we slowly raised the concentration of the particles. Then we kept it constant for let's say half an hour and then we decreased their concentrations. And you can see that our low cost sensor showed almost the same curve as the professional equipment. Of course, these two scales, left and right, these two numbers must then be connected and this is called the calibration. And these were for 0 0.4 micrometer particles. Then we did the same for four, four micrometer particles and this, it is this, this peak here on, uh, in, in the center. You can see again that the correspondence is quite good. 
not so good as, as before, but still very good. And at the end, also with one micrometer particles, we increased the concentration and then decreased it. And uh, both machines showed the same. Of course, uh, calibration is needed between the left and the right numbers. And if I plot it, this is the calibration. On the x-axis, you have a true concentration of particles in the air. And on the left one, you have a response of our sensor in volts, OK? So you see that it's quite linear. But of course, for each size, the slope of this calibration curve, of this calibration line, is different. For small particles, the slope is slower, lower. For bigger particles, this slope is bigger, is larger. So the next, next question is how this slope, how, how the slope of this line corresponds to the size of the particles. We plot it on this right chart. This is a log-log scale. So if we have a line in a log-log scale, it means that is a power law. So it means that this slope scales with the diameter of the particle to some power. And now the power one means that the slope with, and with this, the signal would scale with the diameter of the particle. The larger the particle, the larger the particle's diameter, the larger the scattered light. If this power was two, then it was scattered with the second power, this is the area, the cross section of the particle. The larger the area, the more light is reflected. And the third one, if it would be the three to the power of three, that would mean it scales with the volume or with the mass. So the result of our measurements is here. So this n is 1.11. So it scales almost linearly with the diameter, which is quite strange at the first sight. OK, so with this knowledge, we, because we know the sensors respond to a monosized uh, spheres, to a monosized aerosol particles, we can then do the calibration equation of what would be the response of such sensor if the atmosphere was mixed. So if we had some small particles and some big ones mixed together. These are the equations with the, with the parameters that we can fill out. And then we try to test it. So we tested this in a real environment measurement in 2018 in an Italian city of Casino, which is close to Rome, again within the Aeromed project. We chose a busy street with the high traffic pollution. And there were two rush hour peaks, one in the morning, one in the evening. So the concentration of aerosol from traffic varied quite a lot. We had a lot of other machines, other devices, calibrated and expensive that we could compare uh, our data with. And in one week, we sampled quite a lot of data, about eight gigabytes of data. More than seven million pulses were recorded and saved. So I will just show you quickly the results. In the upper part, you have the, the voltage on our sensors. We had two devices, two copies of the same device, just to, to see how the inter-device variation is big. And you can see that even if you have two identical sensors on the same place, you can get different results. And here at the bottom are the calibrated outputs for three different fractions of aerosol samples. So for, for smaller than one micrometer, for uh, the size between one and 2.5 micrometers and larger than 2.5 micrometers. Uh, you can see that in principle, it works the same. We can, we can identify most of the peaks that are identified by uh, expensive device also in our low cost device. But of course, there is a problem with scaling or calibration. So now can we predict using the equation that we had and using the knowledge of the atmosphere that was at that time, can we make, can we calculate this curve? This is what we have done on the on, on this slide. So the blue one is prediction and the black one is the one that is measured. 
So you can see that, again, we have this problem with offset. For first three days, there is different offset than for the second three days and different offset for the last three days. So this calibration that I showed you depends on time. Basically what it depends on is we had different types of aerosol particles in the first three days, in the second three days, and then you see a drop. This was when the rain was, it was raining one evening and it washed the atmosphere. And then another types of aerosol appears. So uh, we again have different. So uh, all these results that I'm showing you to, today are published in an open access article. So every, everyone can read it and access it in the sensors journal. And here is, uh, you, you can see the link. And also the data, all these gigabytes of, of uh, data uh, of pulses are made uh, available open uh, in the Zenodo repository of uh, by uh, Aeromed2 consortium. So everyone can download it and uh, play with it and uh, see other data and maybe even find some new effect that we missed. So what have we learned? We have learned that in order to fully extract the relevant data from the sensor output, we must understand deeply and well how the sensor works. And there is a problem. The manufacturer of the low cost sensors do not provide detailed information about the sensors. And sometimes they are even misleading. So blindly following the manufacturers recite from the data sheet, will give you a device that works, that gives out some number, but that number can be completely wrong. So you cannot use it for anything serious. You can compare, you can make relative measurements, like how is it today compared to yesterday, uh, but not to say, oh, this is too high, we should get some official alarm that uh, the air is too polluted or something. You just cannot use it for that. Uh, the manufacturer also gives no instructions regarding data analysis. Now, I didn't show you this, but uh, we try to average different windows, let's say one minute averaging, five minutes, 15 minutes averaging window, and the results and the uncertainty of this change, of course. Uh, and the final answer is that we have not yet found a way to calibrate this kind of low cost sensors universally. So to be valid for different aerosols particles or different aerosols distributions. So unfortunately, no good news on this side. And uh, that will be all for this moment. This work was done with, as we mentioned, Aeromet 1 and 2 project. I would like to thank IRSN in Paris, UNICAS, University of Casino for environmental campaign, and of course, the Open Art Society for this presentation opportunity. And if there are any questions, please feel free to send me email. And that would be it, thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. So now there is space for, for questions. Thank you. Uh, no, no, we just tried two of them. We, we, we were limited with uh, Raspberry Pis that we had uh, in charge, but uh, so one Raspberry Pi, one sensor, this is how we, uh, this is the answer to, to the question. Did you try more than two sensors at the same time for variation between pieces? And the answer is no, just two of them.
I'm wondering if uh, anybody else, because I can see, oh, okay, it's coming now. <laughs> Okay, let me read this. Uh, is there any chance to distinguish between, between various particle types on these sensors? The Chinese devices out with PM2.5, PM5, and PM10, but I think I cannot trust it. Uh, yes, this was also my questions. Um, we wondered if the shape pulse maybe changes, the shape of the pulse, if it changes with the different uh, aerosol size, but unfortunately it doesn't on this one. Uh, what you are referring to is the one sensor that has um, a continuous light is the one that, that I showed. It has two, uh, two outputs, PM2.5 and PM10. But what it does, it, it just looks at the magnitude of the scattered light. So if the magnitude is high, it says this must be PM10 particles. But it can also be several small PM2.5 particles. This is this is uh, uh, this is the problem. So basically, these sensors with one light source and one photo detector is a simple one color LED and a simple photo detector. Uh, they just cannot basically distinguish anything. What you get is the amount of scattered light, and you have no idea whether this light was scattered from one large particle or several small particles. And as I showed you, you cannot even say. Maybe, maybe they have similar mass or something, you know, three small particles maybe have the same mass as one large particle and that would be the same reflection. It's not, un unfortunately. So you can only use these low cost particle, uh, these low cost sensors if you know your atmosphere, if you know exactly what kind of particles are in the air, then you can say something out of this. Uh, uh, of the signal of this low cost sensor. So one of the applic of possible applications of these low cost sensors is that you have one, uh, like I say, the mothership. So it's a big expensive uh, device that gives you a very detailed information uh, at one point, but then let's say 50, 100 meters around, you can have a mesh of such low cost sensors. And with this, you can cover large area. Instead of having many expensive devices, you have one expensive device, and then uh, all these low cost sensors that are in the vicinity. And if you assume the uh, pollution is the same type, they can give you then additional information ab about how this pollution moves, how the cloud, from which the direction the cloud came. So you can do this uh, time analysis and uh, so on to maybe identify the source or, or, or something. Uh, in order to do this with expensive machines, you would need a grid, a mesh of a lot of such expensive machines. And of course, this is, this is impossible. Okay, Clement, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I don't know if uh, we can wait a little bit longer if more people come up with more questions. Um, but yeah, it was really good to have you here. Um, and thanks again.